Thanks for having me come and talk. I, I feel like since my advisor is here, I should mention I'm now in the stats department. So, um, so this is sort of the microbial appendix to today's, uh, today's talk. So uh, I'm gonna be talking again about uh, microbes, and particularly, it's a, it's a method talk. But before I jump into the method, I just wanted to take a moment to look here at the tree of life. Uh, so this is everything that we know and, and sequenced and put on the tree of life. And just uh, note these three red branches right here. And, and this is everything we have ever seen in our lives with our naked eyes. So that's the plants, the animal, and the fungi. And everything else on this, uh, the tree of life, is microbial. And um, so this is kind of my pitch for the microbial supremacy. And all of that diversity of metabolism, of lifestyle, of habitat exists in all the rest of this. And one of the reasons we care about that is, as Dr. Blazer was talking about, we're all covered in a cloud of microbes there within us and on us. And um, we're increasingly realizing that that's likely involved with a lot of human phenotypes that we care about. They affect our health in various ways. They don't digest our food for us, but they contribute to that process. And we're learning a lot more about what effects they have on human health uh, in, in recent times. So um, this is a methods talk, and so there's a method called amplicon sequencing, which has probably kind of revolutionized the study of microbial populations and, uh, and the human microbiome. And what this is, this is different than a whole, whole genome resequencing. So what you do is you take a sample, so for instance, from the gut, you grind it up, you use a PCR uh, with a primer that's specific for a particular gene, the bacteria, you amplify up that DNA and then sequence that little chunk of DNA. So you don't know anything about the whole genome, but this barcode that you picked out, you're able to amplify up and sequence very deeply from your community. And you can use that to basically census a bacterial community. And so this has been a very um, powerful workhorse technique, if I'm not mistaken, all of the descriptions of the microbiota in Dr. Blazer's talk were generated uh, by this technique. Um, and uh, it is uh, widely used. So there have been more than 10,000 studies using this method published just since 2010. So there's a very sort of well-defined problem here. Um, and it's the amplicon inference problem. So I have this stack of sequencing reads but those sequencing reads contain errors introduced either during PCR amplification or during uh, the, the sequencing process itself. So there's noise. So I want to infer from that stack of sequence, sequencing reads what the actual underlying sample sequences were and their associated abundances. And for those more uh, familiar with the problem of, of human resequencing, this is very different from the resequencing problem. And the difference is that when I, we resequence a human being, we know that at each position, there's either one or two variants. And so eventually, depth trivializes the problem of correctly guess, getting the genotype. Here, that's not the case. So if I sequence at 10,000 reads, if the 10,000 first read is different, that might just be a new rare variant in my community. And so this is a much more difficult problem in some ways, because I don't have that limited set of possibilities. So this is what that looks like, uh, sort of a schematic. So this is my sample. And there are four different sample types with four sequences in my sample. And the size of these circles is how abundant they are in the sample. Now when I do my amplicon sequencing, noise is generated. And this is, what, this is now my data that I want to analyze. And it should be noted that I've cheated. I don't actually have colors on this data. This data at this point is all just black. I don't know from which, point, uh, from which sample these sequencing reads came. So the way this data is almost universally analyzed is through the construction of OTUs. And so what OTUs are, it stands for Operational Taxonomic Unit, but this is how they're created. I go to my most abundant sequence, I draw a radius around it of 3%, and it's always 3% because everyone does 3%. And everything within that radius, I just collapse together. That's one OTU. Then I go to the next thing remaining, the blue guy, draw the same radius, collapse. This has reduced the impact of error on my estimate of the community. But I've also lost information by this coarse graining process that I went through. 
So I'm going to talk about a method called Data2. And uh, we're going to take this seriously as a problem in unsupervised learning. And we're not going to try and construct these OTUs. We're going to try and infer exactly the sample sequences and their associated abundances that produced the sequencing reads in our sample. And uh, the, the preprint for this is available, and uh, it probably will be fully published pretty soon. Data two. So to do this, we're going to model the error process. So we want to model the errors introduced during amplification and sequencing, and particularly thinking about Illumina sequencing. So we have a sequencing read S, and a, we have a sample sequence S, and a sequencing read R. We line them up, we align them, and we can go down the, uh, the length of the sequence and note where they match and where they don't match. And we're going to model the probability of getting sequencing read R from sample sequence S by multiplying at each position the probability of getting an A where there was an A, times the probability of getting a T where there was a T, times the probability of getting a C where there was a T. So we're going to treat each nucleotide independently. And we're gonna allow that per nucleotide probability to depend on the uh, true nucleotide, the red nucleotide, the quality score at that position, and a batch effect, because every sequencing run is different, unfortunately. It would be a lot easier if that wasn't the case, but they are all different. And so this is going to be our model of the error process that gets us from sample sequences to sequencing reads. So we are going to use this to uh, define the probability of seeing that many or more identical sequences, the number of repeated observations of the same sequence. And we're going to use that to differentiate errors from biology. So at position zero, there's a very abundant sequence. Let's say seen 200 times. It's not pictured. I'm going to walk away from that, sequ uh, that sequence in sequence space. So this is hammy distance one away, hammy distance two, hammy distance three. And on the y-axis is how many times I repeatedly saw the same sequence at that distance away. So this guy right here is one away from this abundant sequence, and I saw it six times. So when the OTU methods, what they do is they draw this line right here, and everything to the right of the line is new biology, and everything to the left of the line are errors. And this, li this line is that 3% radius that I talked about. So our error model, we're going to use a Poisson distribution of the repeated observations of a sequence based on that error model I described previously. And so what that looks like is this separatrix between biology and errors. So as I move further away from the sequence, repeated observations get more and more unlikely. So one away, I see it six times, that's consistent with the error process. But something five away, and I see that six times, that's not an error, that's new biology. And so that's the criteria that we're going to use to separate um, biology from errors. So this is embedded in a larger algorithm, which I don't have time to talk about. Um, but now I'll show you how that uh, affects the accuracy of sample inference when we use our method. So simulated data, you should never trust anybody showing you results on simulated data. So I'm going to show you results on simulated data. Um, so this is from a paper that came out two weeks ago by people familiar with this. It's the people who developed Chime, published a benchmarking paper. And they have a simulated data set. This data set has 1,055 variants separated by between 1 and 50 nucleotides from each other and ranging in abundance from one read up to 200 reads. So our method finds 1,042 out of those 1,055 variants. The ones it misses are almost entirely present in just one read. And when you look at the abundances that are inferred for those variants, well, a picture says 1,000 words. The abundances are being inferred almost exactly correctly. So uh, Chime, so this is Chime u clust technically. One of the problems with these common OTU methods, and this is perhaps the most common OTU method in use, is that they aren't delivering on one of the promises of this technology, which is the ability to differentiate rare variants. So here, x-axis is the Hamming distance from the nearest largest sequence 
It's similar to the x-axis previously. Y-axis is abundance, or the frequency. And the red dots here are mistakes. So they're spurious outputs by this OTU method. And you can see there are many, many spurious outputs uh, starting at about oh, 10 to the minus 3 frequency and below. And so there is no effective resolution of rare variants because they're overwhelmed by spurious outputs. So when we run our method, we get rid of almost all of those spurious outputs. And you actually have effective resolution down to very low frequencies. You can resolve rare variants. So the other advantage that our method has, uh, so now I'm, I'm using another method. This is uParse. It's another OTU method, but more accurate than Chime. Makes fewer mistakes. Um, but you'll note, this is the OTU radius, this dashed line. It, it doesn't resolve anything within the OTU radius. So when we run our algorithm on the same data set, we lose a couple mistakes, and we resolve all of this real biological variation within that 3% OTU radius. So our method is using this error model to achieve both effective resolution of rare variants and fine scale variation of, of uh, near, nearby sample sequences. So we're interested in the microbiome of pregnancy and its effect on preterm birth. And um, in particular, in a previous study, we found there's a relationship between the vaginal community and preterm birth outcomes. And one of the unique features of the vaginal community is it's often dominated by a single species of lactobacillus. And so uh, on the x-axis here are different samples. So th this is a study where 42 women were sampled three to five times during pregnancy. Samples from the same woman are connected by these little black bars. Uh, and I'm showing you just those samples that were dominated by lactobacillus crispatus, which is the most common species of lactobacillus. So this study was published last year, and this is their results. So they find a single OTU of lactobacillus crispatus dominates the community when it's in this state. So we ran our method on the same data, and we're able to resolve a significant diversity of lactobacillus crispatus strains because of our ability to resolve fine scale variation. And so this gives us a more accurate window into these communities. So, so we can now differentiate the communities of these different women. We can see that the strain level variation is consistent over the course of pregnancy. And we can potentially relate these different lactobacillus crispatus strains to health outcomes, which is, which is ultimately um, our goal. So this is, just now, this is the method is available now. Um, so this is a, an R package. Uh, it's available on, on GitHub. It will, be, it will be on Bioconductor, if you're familiar with that repository. Uh, it's open source. You can download scripts to, uh, that, that run through this, do some benchmarking, and do a tutorial that you can run on your own computer. And um, the preprint is available, and the, the full publication will be available soon. And I want to thank uh, Susan, in particular, who's in the, in the back there, uh, Joey McBurdy, and also Mike Rosen was an important part in developing some of the ideas in this algorithm. So thank you.